Tony Blair, welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, so you're, you're you know, very well known to Americans, and you know, not just Americans, but people around the world are scratching their head now after two and a half years of this and trying to figure out which way is up about Brexit. So I wonder if you can explain what's going on. Let me just read you a little from the Wall Street Journal. They have an essay entitled The Great Brexit Breakdown, and it says, from afar, the spectacle of the UK undergoing the national political equivalent of a nervous breakdown has been a source of head scratching. The country, once defined by its stiff upper lip, has been indulging in a kind of orgy of public histrionics, more commonly associated with Latin American telenovelas. What do you say to that as a former prime minister? Well, well it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult time for us. So look, the, the, the situation is this. The country voted to leave the European Union in, in June 2016. Since then, we've had 30 months of negotiation. And what the negotiations really revealed is that in the end, Britain faces a choice of two different futures. It can either stay close to the trading system of the European Union, because we've been four and a half decades in Europe. So you've got a host of commercial relationships, investment relationships, trading relationships. You know, for four and a half decades, our economy has been trading within the European system. And roughly 60% of our trade is governed by European arrangements. So you can either stay close to that trading system, but in which case Europe's going to say, OK, if you want access to our markets like you have the access now, you've got to keep to our rules, right? You can't, you can't join the club or be part of the club and have, have your own rules. So that's one Brexit. But the problem with that is it immediately leads you to the question, well, what's the point of Brexit then? <laughs> if the purpose of Brexit is to break free of all those rules, then if you stay part of the European system, people say, well, we've left, but we've not left. OK, so that's one alternative. The other alternative is that you do what the, the hard Brexiteers, the, the true Brexiteers in a way really want. You get out of the single market of Europe, its unique trading system. You get out of the customs union. You break free of all those rules. But then, since business is going to be severely disrupted by that, because you've been trading within this system for a long time, then it's going to be painful. And so it's what's the point versus what's the price. And the trouble is, painful or pointless is not a good choice. So really what these 30 months have done, the Prime Minister has been trying to reach agreement. She eventually has come out with a deal that's frankly neither one nor the other. And Parliament split. Parliament's gridlocked. Right. So par he Parliament. He here we are. I mean, yeah. you've just, I think, just They're coined a new slogan. What's the point versus what's the price? That's pretty interesting. Now, we all know where you stand as former prime minister, as former leader of the Labour Party. You obviously were a Remainer. You remain a Remainer. And you want a second referendum. Um, is that wishful thinking at this point? Or do you believe seriously, politically, that momentum is seriously moving towards a second referendum? Yes, I think it is moving that way. Look, uh, a year ago when I first said this, or I think 18 months ago when I first said it, people dismissed it as as fantasy and definitely as wishful thinking. But no, I think as, as, as you carry on and you see the mess of this negotiation, look, Parliament can't agree. You've got the Prime Minister subject to a no confidence vote from a, her own party and then from the Parliament. OK, she survived both, but you've got one part of the Cabinet saying one thing, another part of the Cabinet. This is the Cabinet saying another thing. I don't think it's unreasonable in those circumstances to say, we've got to take this back to the British people to resolve. Ex you know, they first of all said they wanted to leave. Now, when we're gridlocked, they've got to resolve the gridlock. So what, just for, you know, an exercise in this, what would you put as the questions for a second referendum? It obviously cannot be the same question, yes or no, in or out, uh, as the last one in 2016. Yeah, but I think the thing is, you can do the question in one of two ways. I mean, some people are saying in Parliament that you could have a question that, as it were, has staying or close to Europe or breaking free from Europe. So you can have an options. I mean, I'm, I think there are you know, some difficulties with that, but you could do that. Alternatively, you just take the two things that really have public support. I mean, in every single published opinion poll, there are two propositions that have support. One is staying. The other is what I would call true Brexit. In other words, you break free of that trading system. You know, you're prepared to go through the pain uh, because you think it's so important to be free of the European Union. And you could have a, a referendum with that simple choice. So 
I don't think the question's that difficult. The real issue is people say, look, we made our decision in June 2016. If you go back and ask the people again, that's, that's dishonoring the mandate of June 2016, to which my answer is, yep, but you know, we, can't, we don't know precisely what that mandate is now because you've got different versions of Brexit. You've had 30 months of negotiation. Our knowledge of what has happened is infinitely greater. It's not really a democratic outrage to go back and ask the people again. Okay, well, the current Prime Minister, that's your view as the former Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister, Theresa May, has said exactly the opposite. I mean, she's implied that it's anti-democratic, that uh, it's akin to a coup. I mean, those aren't her words, but others have used it. And even some Tories and some members of your own party have used the specter of social unrest should the country go to what they call a very divisive another referendum. Here's what the Prime Minister said just yesterday in Parliament. I set out many times my deep concerns about returning to the British people for a second referendum. Our duty is to implement the decision of the first one. I fear a second referendum would set a difficult precedent that could have significant implications for how we handle referendums in this country. Not least, not least strengthening the hand of those campaigning to break up our United Kingdom. <laughs> so there's a lot in there, uh, undemocratic, break up our United Kingdom, uh, you know, a lot of that. W what do you say to that? Okay, well, let's just unpack that for a moment. First of all, by the way, the single biggest threat to the UK, to the United Kingdom, is Brexit. It causes enormous tensions in Northern Ireland, and we haven't yet resolved the Irish border issue. Scotland voted overwhelmingly to stay in the, United, uh, in the European Union, so you've got a problem with Scotland when you, you do Brexit. If you do a hard Brexit, that is, that is for sure the biggest strain you're going to impose uh, on, on the integrity of the United Kingdom. Secondly, you know, look, even if we had had a good negotiation, even if out of the negotiation, you'd had a deal and Parliament had passed the deal, there is a perfectly reasonable case for saying, back in June 2016, we didn't know the alternative to European Union membership. That was to be negotiated. And it's perfectly reasonable once you see the alternative, once you, you know the house you're going to be moving to, after you've decided to leave the house you're in, that you're entitled to think again. That would be perfectly reasonable in my view. But, okay, the situation we're in today is where there's no agreement as to what form of Brexit. The Prime Minister can't get her deal through. She got defeated by 200 votes on it in the House of Commons. A huge defeat. So in those circumstances where we're in this mess, is it really undemocratic to go back and ask the people? We're not asking some other people, by the way. We're asking the people uh, whether they want to proceed or not. And when people say it's going to cause social unrest, I mean, from whom? I mean, people who... If they, if they still want to leave, they've got a perfect opportunity to come and make their case. But, you know, this was a vote two and a half years ago that wasn't like 65 or 70 percent 30 or 65, 35. You know, I think if you really take a step back and look at it, in these circumstances, is it really unreasonable for MPs to say, look, we've looked at the deal, the various options on offer. We can't personally support this. We don't think this is in the interests of you our constituents that we represent in this parliament, but we're handing the decision, final decision back to you. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it's a little unreasonable as people are protesting about being asked their opinion in those circumstances. And we do obviously know that there have been referendums that have been run again in other countries about other issues and it's gone down fine. Um, but I guess the real question is, so if you were prime minister now and you had put some kind of proposal to Parliament, and you see this deadlock, not just in, uh, in the Conservative Party, which is riven by hardliners against the, I don't know, the moderates against the Prime Minister, but also in your own party, the loyal opposition is now riven also by, by Remain or, or, or the leaders, you know, desired for Brexit and not to have a second referendum. What would you, as a guy who was elected three times to be Prime Minister of this country, what would you do to unblock this. I would have a situation where you lay out the options for people, because these are, are the options. Stay close to Europe, like, for example, Norway, break free from Europe, have a free trade agreement like Canada, 
uh, no deal, uh, right? Um, which would obviously be a bad idea. Um, her deal or a, another referendum. And the only way of resolving this is to lay it out for people, explain the options, because expl they're all perfectly clear in their implications, by the way, and then allow Parliament to decide. And that's the only way, really, you can resolve this. You've got to run an indicative set of votes, and in the end, Parliament's going to have to make up its mind. Mm -hmm. And that's what it will do, by the way. And the reason why I think in the end it will come to a, another referendum is because the alternatives are all unpalatable. The thing about this is all the way through people have thought of this as a negotiation, and it's really a choice in the end. Britain's got to choose which future it wants. And what this negotiation's taught us is what the, those futures really look like. And the only sensible thing is to have MPs decide it, and then if they can't decide it, the people. Okay, so you said, uh, you know, no sensible people can really get behind a no deal. But these are people, they make up, from what I gather, about 15% of, of the, the, the relevant people, the sort of hardliners in the Tory party. And this prime minister apparently doesn't want to be the prime minister who splits the Tory party or splits the country or whatever. But it seems that she's in hock to them. I don't know how you view it, again, as a former prime minister, you know, having this insurgency on her right flank that, by the way, has already played its cards and they've lost. But do you think she's still tacking to the hardline Brexiters, the Boris Johnsons, the Jacob Rees-Moggs, the John Redwoods, those types? Yeah, I think to, to a degree, yes. But I mean, I think, to be honest, she'll tack whichever way she thinks there is a majority for her deal. And I think at the moment she thinks it's best to tack towards, towards them. But, you know, if the purpose was to reunite the Conservative Party, I think we can agree it's failed. <laughs> and... You know, you said the Labour Party's uh, divided Christian, and that's true, but to a much more limited degree. The Labour Party as a party, by the way, it is massively in favour of staying in Europe and in favour of another referendum. It's true there are... MPs, yeah, but the leader isn't, who voted Prime Minister, the leader way. isn't, and, and the, you're right, the rank and file want to remain, and there seems to be a lot of uh, build for a second referendum amongst the rank and file of the Labour Party, but not the leadership. No, the leadership's been very reluctant, and I think the amendment they tabled yesterday is a big step forward and an indication that they're recognising this is eventually where we'll, we'll get to another referendum. But, um, you know, there are, look, it, th this is really difficult, and, and, and no one should pretend there are easy solutions. And I've often said, by the way, at one level, I completely sympathise with the Prime Minister. It's a hugely difficult task. She's faced on every side by people advocating different things, and her own party is pretty unreasonable, and her coalition party, um, the DUP, can often be extremely unreasonable. So, you know, it's a difficult, difficult situation that she's in, but, you know, the only way out is to let Parliament try and reach an agreement. You can't do that, really, unless you put each option before them and say, here it is, you've got to decide which one do you want. Okay, so let me just go back to how it's being viewed overseas. I mean, on the one hand, Britain always you know, certainly in its modern history, was the little country that could, constantly punching above its weight. And people are now thinking, oh boy, you know, what, what's up? I mean, this common sense country is in meltdown. Um, it is, you know, kind of going a little viral around the world now, this constant soap opera and drama that we're seeing played out here. And even celebrities are busy tweeting. We have one American model, and this is a British columnist who wrote this, um, spoke for large swaths of society when she tweeted, one of my goals for 2019 is to understand UK politics. I read and read and I try and learn, but my brain cannot grasp it. So I can see you smiling. I'm sure you agree. But let me ask you about the European leaders there. I mean, you have tried to do an end run around the prime minister and you've been lobbying for a second referendum with the Europeans. What are they saying now, today, at this point? Where do they think it's going to go? Well, look, I think everyone's pretty confused right now. By the way, just to make this point, and I, I should say this in defense of my, my own country, you know, Britain remains a serious and great nation, and we'll get through this one way or another. And even if we end up doing Brexit, which I passionately hope we don't, you know, we'll get on our feet and we'll move forward. So, you know, don't, anyone who writes us off will be making a mistake. Um, but I agree, our politics is pretty confusing right now, even to those of us involved in it. No, what, I, what I've been saying to the, um, the European leaders is, is not, you know, you should support a second referendum. That's not their business. It's up to us to decide the way forward. What I've been saying to them is the underlying causes of Brexit, the immigration issue, anxiety about cultural and national identity, 
these are underlying issues everywhere in Europe today. I mean, the last 30 months hasn't just turned British politics on its head. You look around Europe, and you'll know this, Christian, very well from, from the, the analysis you do and the interviews you do with people in Europe. I mean, the truth is the whole of European politics is convulsed at the moment. And that's why the sensible thing, in my view, is for Britain to think again, but Europe also to think again, to realize that, that it's going to have to come to a different type of settlement around issues to do with migration and identity, and that it's going to have to recognize that in the future, those countries that are part of the Eurozone are going to integrate in a different way and in a bigger way than those countries outside it. Mm -hmm. And so what I've really been discussing with the European leaders is, you know, it's our business to build the support for going back to the people. But should we do so, you know, you guys should think carefully also about what you can say that helps the process of Europe staying together and, and you know, Staying together is important for Europe as well. Britain coming out of Europe is not just bad for Britain. It's very bad for Europe as well. Again, I'm assuming you're putting that case to the European leaders you meet there right now. But let me ask you finally, it's our final question, about the point of Davos all these years later. You know very well that Davos is considered the sort of hobnobbing of the elite, the very people who threw so many millions of people around the world into the calamity that they find themselves in now and led to the rise of populism. Let me just play you this little soundbite from uh, a guy who's kind of gone viral right now, Anand Girdadas, who's just written this book, you know, Winner Takes All, The Charade of the Global Elites. Look what he just told me. I think Davos should end. I think it should be canceled this year and, and should, should end going forward. It is a family reunion for the people who, in my view, broke the modern world. I mean, you can't argue with that, right? I can. <laughs> Look, it's the easiest line in the world to make, by the way. You know, I tell you what I do when I come to Davos. So later today, I'll be meeting three of my presidents from Africa. I don't think they broke the economic system. I'll be meeting a whole lot of people from multilateral institutions who work in the developing world. I'm here because my institute, which is a not-for-profit institute, works in, in some of the poorest parts of the world trying to help them. And, you know, to be fair, the people who come here, they're discussing serious issues. So it's the easiest play in the world. Say, oh, you know, all these people are coming along here, the global elite and so on. And by the way, you know, these arguments about cultural identity and nationalism, in my experience, you've got elites on either side of the argument. So, you know, Davos, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's an opportunity for people to come and network on issues of importance. And, you know, some people... Um, you know, may come here who are billionaires from different parts of the world, but other people come because some of the issues that they're discussing here are important. On that note, Tony Blair, former Prime Minister, thank you for joining me. Thanks very much, Christiane. All the best.